Acts chapter 9, verses 31 through 43. Acts 9, beginning in verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt at Leda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately, so all who dwelt at Leda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Leda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them, and when he had come, they brought him to the upper room, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out, and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. In the last several studies, we encountered numerous indications that God was ready to formally and publicly move the Messianic kingdom into the third stage of its growth. Remember that Jesus announced in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 that the kingdom would begin in Jerusalem, then it would expand throughout all Judea and into Samaria, and finally to the ends of the earth, at which point no Gentile nation regardless of how far removed it is from God and his revelation, would be outside the active pursuit of Jesus' reign. Through the persecution organized by Saul of Tarsus, the massive body of believers in Jerusalem was stirred up and scattered. Now, I use this expression, stirred up, as an allusion to Deuteronomy 32, verse 11, where Moses describes the work of God in bringing Israel to the promised land. He said, As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so the Lord led Israel. On this passage, Dr. James E. Smith offers the following comments. Yahweh educated Israel as a mother eagle, teaches her eaglets to fly. The allusion is to the habit of the mother eagle, to make the nest uncomfortable with sharp objects so that the baby will be forced to the edge. The mother pushes the baby over the side. As the eaglet falls earthward, the mother swoops beneath at the last possible moment to rescue her young. Thus do baby eaglets learn to fly. I believe we have something of the same kind in the history of the early church. In a church entirely peopled by Jews... Jerusalem was a comfortable place to be and to stay. Without the stirring up of the nest, they may have never expanded beyond the city. And since the future of the city was judgment, that would have been as ruinous to them as to the rest of the world, which would have been deprived of the gospel message. So God worked to move them out. Acts chapter 1, or rather Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 says... They were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. 
Congregations were established as a result of this work, and in time, the apostles were notified and began to venture out to visit the new Christians and to impart the gifts of the Spirit to them. In Acts chapter 8, we were given insight into a wonderful event that most of the believing world went on oblivious to at the time it transpired, the conversion of an Ethiopian man. His baptism and subsequent return home, strangely without being instructed in the way of Christ, was a prophetic signal that soon the kingdom of heaven would catch up with him and his discipleship would be completed. In Acts chapter 9, we return to the case of Saul, who in a marvelous example of God's ability to redeem an enemy against his cause, was claimed as a disciple of Jesus Christ and told that he was going to be sent to the Jewish people as well as to the Gentiles to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus. Acts 26, verses 17 through 18. Jesus told Ananias, Saul is a chosen vessel of mine, to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, Acts 9 and verse 15. And over the next three years, Saul was prepared and instructed by Jesus himself through revelations in Arabia for this remarkable ministry. However, Jerusalem was not ready for him. In fact, the church was probably not ready for him on the whole. So he was sent away to Tarsus, And in a future study, we will consider the things he did over the next several years, possibly a decade. But for now, Luke directs our focus back to the ministry of Peter. Acts 9, 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. These are the places where the gospel spread through the stirring up by persecution. And now there were churches or congregations all throughout these regions. It is noteworthy that the oldest and best manuscripts have church in the singular. So the New American Standard Version reads, Thus the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace. Even still, there were clearly multiple congregations in this wide geographical territory. So we find conclusive proof that the followers of Jesus throughout a region— or throughout the world, can be called the church, even though they make up several local churches. In contemporary theological jargon, this is described by the terms the universal church and local churches. But I suggest a clearer way of describing it is to think of the great congregation. This is the language of Psalm twenty-two twenty-five, which describes the Lord's people in general, and the congregation at such and such a place, such as the congregation of Christ, which is at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. One of the significant bearings this language has on our understanding of Acts so far is that even though Luke has consistently spoken of the church in Jerusalem, this does not mean that there was only one congregation. As we have stated in earlier studies, the better conception is that there were hundreds, perhaps thousands, of small congregations that met for Christian worship in homes, and that on occasion, perhaps very frequently, even daily, the massive lot of them would gather in a place like the temple to hear the apostles preach until persecution made that impossible. At a later stage, the church at Jerusalem would have consisted of these several small house churches throughout the city and the surrounding districts, and the apostles would visit them and impart the gifts of the Spirit among them, just as they did other congregations in these other regions. Luke says that God worked out a marvelous reversal of circumstances and brought an end to the persecution which he had used to the furtherance of his own cause. What a mighty God we serve. The church grew, it expanded, it had peace, and was edified. These things likely took place around A.D. 39 or 40, at which time Caligula became the emperor of Rome and appointed Petronius the governor of Syria, which would have included all these regions. 
According to Josephus, Caligula ordered that a statue of himself was to be set up as an object of worship in the temple at Jerusalem, and Petronius rallied an army and began marching from Antioch to do just this. The Jews reacted, as we might expect, with frantic opposition, and this situation distracted them from the followers of Jesus for a little while until Caligula was assassinated in A.D. 41. The persecution of the church will begin once more after this in Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. But this was a season of peace. When seasons of peace are granted in the merciful providence of God, we should take full advantage of them and use them to God's glory. The church did just that. They were edified or built up. Some scholars take this to mean that they were formally organized by the appointment of church officers like elders and deacons. This is very possible because we're going to find that was a high priority to the early church. And in just a short while, we're going to see young churches with a well-developed sense of functional organization. This would be a great blessing to the churches when seasons of hardship resumed. Modern congregations which have enjoyed decades or centuries of peace without seriously working to achieve maturity and stability, especially in organization, would do well to receive a sharp rebuke from this example and repent to follow it while they still have a chance. Luke continues, And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Not only did they grow in stability, but they also grew or were multiplied numerically. How does this happen? Again, the church here represents an example to all others in subsequent generations. They walked, a word which seems to refer to their daily lives and the identities which they accepted for themselves, but the New American Standard Version says they were going on. And this is particularly meaningful to show that they persevered. The previous persecution did not frighten them into inactivity, but rather they rejoiced in God's mighty demonstration of power to overcome it by converting the chief persecutor, and they went on. Their disposition moving forward was in the fear of the Lord. That is, they were moved by witnessing God's amazing demonstration of universal sovereignty stirring up the situation and then settling it down again, to have a deep awe and respect toward him manifest in scrupulous obedience to his commands. Luke also says they enjoyed the comfort of the Holy Spirit. This is the verb form of the word paraclete, translated helper, in the New King James Version in John chapters 14 through 16, or comforter in the Old King James Version. We've discussed this word before in reference to the apostles. The Holy Spirit inspired them and empowered them to work miracles and to teach infallibly to help them in the accomplishment of their special mission for Jesus. But the Spirit was also helping or comforting the church as a whole. Certainly the work of the apostles is in view in this expression. Gareth Reese points out that the same term is used of Barnabas in Acts chapter 4 verse 36 to describe his abilities as a teacher in speaking words of counsel and instruction and encouragement. So Reese suggests we look primarily at the words of the prophets for the antecedent to this statement. But it might also refer to his impartation of spiritual gifts to the churches, his work in assisting the evangelism of gospel preachers as he did with Philip, and whatever other general works of empowerment the Spirit did and does in the lives of Christians. Verse 32. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all the parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. In Acts chapter 8, we saw Peter and John sent to the new congregations in Samaria to impart the Holy Spirit to them. And when Paul was in Jerusalem, the other apostles were not there. Likely they were out doing the same thing in other places. Now here is Peter once more doing this work throughout the region, contributing to the upbuilding and understanding and submission and participation in the Holy Spirit of the churches. There were now saints, which is another term for disciples of Christ, who dwelt at Lydda. 
The city would have been along Philip's route to Caesarea in Acts chapter 8 and verse 40, so it's possible that he established this congregation, or perhaps it came from some other believer during the scattering evangelism. Verse 33, There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he arose immediately. The miracles Peter works in this section are very similar to the miracles Jesus worked during his earthly ministry, especially those in John 5, verses 5 through 9, and Mark 5, verses 41 and 42. Now, the reason for this is not that Luke is trying to do some kind of literary echo back to the life and ministry of Jesus, but rather it is, as Peter states, because Jesus the Christ was the one truly at work in this ministry of Peter. Jesus healed this man and did all other wonders through the apostles to confirm their word and his life and reign. Verse 35, So all who dwelt at Leda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Sharon was the coastal plain of about 30 miles stretching from Mount Carmel in the north to Joppa in the south. Luke says, all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon. Something of a hyperbole to express that the news became very widespread, and equally so, the reaction of the people in turning to the Lord. When Luke says people turned to the Lord, we learned in Acts 3.19 that meant they were converted. And it would have been by the same process as everyone else. After seeing the miracle or hearing about it and witnessing its impact, they would give serious attention to the preaching of Peter. They would be thereby led to trust in Jesus as Christ. They would submit their hearts to him, and they would be baptized. We need not make issues over the absence of an elaborate recounting of all these details, because by this point Luke has made it sufficiently clear so that there is no room to wonder how people become Christians. While we do take all here as an exaggeration, it certainly means most, if not all absolutely. If only a handful constituting a small minority turned to the Lord, then this statement would have been dishonest on the part of Luke. So we should learn, when we read the Bible, that its writers use hyperbole, but that does not mean that they were saying the opposite of the truth but rather that the truth is extreme enough, it requires a hyperbole to really capture and communicate it. Verse 36, At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Joppa was a seaport town on the Mediterranean, about 10 or 12 miles from where Peter was in Lydda. And before the building of Caesarea, it was the most significant seaport in the region. You might recall that it was here Jonah went to catch the ship to Tarshish when he was running away from God. Luke tells us that there were disciples here as well. In this verse, he mentions only one. But in the subsequent verses, we find that she was not alone. There was a congregation there. And I suggest that it was a very well-established congregation, but more on that in just a moment. The disciple of interest in Joppa was a woman named Tabitha, the Aramaic word for gazelle, which, Luke says, for the benefit of his Gentile readers, is translated Dorcas, the Greek word for gazelle. She may have been well known to many Christians in the early church because of what happened to her. That's probably why Luke records her name, and the same would be true of Aeneas in the previous account. But I want to spend a little bit of time considering what Luke says about her relationship to the church. In past readings of this section, I took Dorcas to simply be a good woman who did good things for people in need, especially widows who are mentioned later in verses 39 and 41. However, in the last few years, I've been considering more carefully the teachings of Paul in 1 Timothy 5 about those who he calls true widows, or widows indeed, depending on the translation, but who we might more properly call enrolled widows. In 1 Timothy 5 and verse 9, Paul talks about the kind of widow who should be put on the list 
that's the New American Standard Version, or taken into the number, New King James Version, or enrolled, English Standard Version. Paul gives qualifications, 1 Timothy 5, 9-11. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work, but refuse younger widows. Paul mentions that this enrollment was accompanied by what he called a solemn pledge or a vow of service, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 12. And these women would have been supported financially by the church with the expectation that they would use the comfort and stability thus gained to trust in God and continue in supplications and prayers night and day, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 5. It is generally agreed by Bible scholars that these widows would form a special formal group within the ancient congregations where their order existed, who served the church through regular prayers on behalf of the congregation and through good works of mercy of the kind mentioned in Romans 12 and verse 8, caring for the sick and those who needed special attention and spiritual motherhood. Of course, this kind of practice is essentially non-existent in the modern world. Honestly, the closest thing I've ever seen to it is probably a Roman Catholic nunnery, although there are several significant differences between the nunnery and what Paul teaches here. However, it would seem clear that some early congregations had orders of widows who were specially devoted to prayer and good works on behalf of the church— They were not elders or preachers or administrators. They did not teach or lead in the assembly, but they were highly esteemed servants of God. In time, we're going to cover those texts in 1 Timothy 5 in more detail in our studies. But for now, I would suggest to you that Dorcas and the widows mentioned in Acts 9 were of this class described in 1 Timothy 5. While Luke mentions no husband or family when he speaks about her, which seems to indicate that she was unmarried, he says that she was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she continually did, a very fitting summary of Paul's comments in 1 Timothy 5. Furthermore, Luke mentions the widows as a special group alongside the saints, which would be the regular members of the congregation, verse 41. And he says that the widows showed Peter the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. This language seems to describe Dorcas not merely as a servant of the widows, but to use the language of Paul as one of their number. If we're correct in this suggestion, the church at Joppa was quite well organized, even beyond many congregations at the present time, in caring for its needy and enabling its members, even those who seem to be weaker, to fulfill their necessary work in the body. May the Lord help us in pursuing the pattern of primitive Christianity in all of its divine wisdom and beauty. Picking up in verse 37, But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room, And since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. This is a remarkable act of love and faith. Several commentators discuss the practice of hasty burial because of the accelerated rate of decomposition in hot climates. But these Christians have no intention of burying their beloved sister, their mother in the faith. Their hearts were bent on bringing her back even if only for a time. This is an amazing thing. She was dead. So they were certainly implying in seeking Peter that they wanted him to raise her back to life. I know of no other case like this in the Bible where a congregation requested this kind of miraculous intervention after the death of one of its members. And this was not a preacher, not an elder or a prophet. It was a widow who made clothes for the needy. But God's people esteemed her very highly. Verse 39, Then Peter arose and went with them, and when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. 
And all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Again, many commentators point out that the weeping of these widows is not to be confounded with the melodramatic lamentation we sometimes associate with mourners at funerals in those days. It was the solemn and sincere heartbreak of a community who had lost one most precious to them. They bring out evidence of her nobility and virtue to justify that appeal that seems so futile to us today, to bring her back from the passage into the next world. Verse 40, But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. The similarities to Jesus raising the daughter of Jairus are striking. As with her, loved ones pled for this miracle to be performed. As with her, the crowd was told to leave the room. In Peter's case, it was likely to remove the glory from Peter and keep the resulting faith in the community focused on Jesus Christ. You remember that when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter, he said in the Aramaic tongue, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, get up. And here Peter uses Almost the same words, Tabitha, kumi, Tabitha, arise. Luke continues, and she opened her eyes, and when he saw Peter, she sat up. Luke continues, and she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. Both of these miracles were, like all the deeds of the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly and heavenly ministry, remarkable and thrilling. But several scholars have suggested that we know them somewhat by happenstance— They explain why it was known that Peter was in Lydda, and then why he traveled to Joppa, and then why he stayed there many days, which, based on the use of the same expression in Acts 9.23, could have meant several years. But all of this gets him to the place he needs to be for the next event, which is one of the most significant events not only in Acts, but in the history of the world. We will wait for our next study to further discuss this house where Peter was staying and what meaningfulness that carried, but for now, we can join those ancient believers and find peace and edification in these powerful proofs that God is with his people, and no matter what enemies rise up against us and no matter what shadows overcome us, God will help us move on. Thanks again for listening. Please subscribe to keep up with our weekly releases as we continue through the scriptures together. Verse by Verse is brought to you by the 11th Street Church of Christ in Tulsa, Oklahoma. You can contact us at tulsachurchofchrist at gmail.com or visit tulsachurchofchrist.com. From all the dark places of earth, heathen races, oh, see how the thick shadows fly. The voice of salvation awakes every nation, come over and help us, they cry. The kingdom is spreading, oh, tell ye the story, God's better exalted shall be. The earth shall be full of his knowledge and glory as waters that cover the sea. With praising and singing and jubilant ringing, their arms of rebellion cast down. At last every nation, the Lord of salvation, with glory their effort shall crown. The kingdom is spreading, oh, tell ye the story, God's banner exalted shall be. The earth shall be full of his knowledge and glory as waters that cover the sea.